happened today. And I'll hit record now so that we're, we're good to go. Uh, because when there is a hockey team in the desert, maybe that's a sign that uh, you, if you haven't embraced all things modern and different and podcasting being one of those, see how I put those things together there, Ryan? That was seamless. So clever. You've been thinking uh, of this for weeks. I know, literally. Everyone thinks that I'm just making this up as I go. This is, uh, this is very stage managed. Top notch. Um, you guys need to be 100% ready. I'm going to hide my own self view. I'm going to pause my Dropbox. This is talking about being ready. That should be me, but I'm not. Um, you should be ready to be podcasting. Uh, and if you're not by the beginning of this podcast, sorry, by this webinar, you will be by the end. Um, so we've got a few people that have joined us so far and we'll probably have a few scragglers joining in. I know we've got a lot of the USA crew that have done the sneaky and just registered to make sure they get to watch the replay and some of them have already gone to bed because... Yeah. Well, on the East Coast, it's 10 p.m. So it is. So what do you I like? I want to hear like, you right before bed, I guess. Or seven where you are now. It's seven. You wouldn't be able to tell, Ryan. Everybody, uh, Ryan, Phil, Ryan, say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. Now, now, and fill everybody in on where you are right now. Yeah, so I am in Vegas. I came out to, I live in San Diego, and we'll talk about that in the presentation just at the beginning. But I'm actually in Vegas right now. We're out going to the Golden Knights playoff game. And I was like, I don't think I can make it back in enough time to make sure I'm there for the webinar. So don't sound like a podcaster. I'm kind of bootstrapping this thing at my, my parents' house, but uh, I hear and I made it. Awesome. Didn't want to miss it. Excellent. Uh, any of my first time uh, or any of our advice movement first time webinar crew, please give us a shout out on the chat function. So the, the way these things run is I'll run the chat, I'll run the Q and A, I'll run the polls. Um, Ryan will run the show. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why Steve hasn't got off his ass and, and done any podcasting anytime soon. And I reckon I've hit that sort of stage, Ryan, of about a year in and starting to really just struggle with doing it all myself. So I'm interested to find out yeah. definitely about your magical audio wizard that's going to do all the editing stuff that I hate. Um, yeah. But we've got a few first timers. So Chris has just joined us. Uh, Trish who I know is desperate to do podcasting and Trish, you're coming to XYPN. Uh, sorry, not XYPN. You're coming to FinCon and Ryan, are you going back to FinCon again this year? Yeah, I put a, I actually put together a panel of a bunch of advisors that podcast. I was going to yeah. moderate it. And then they took three of them and gave them their own speaking slot. So wow. I'm trying to, uh, to see if I can get a speaking slot now and I'll talk on podcasting there as well. Well, there you go. So this is how uh, Ryan is a bit of a big deal, guys. He won't make out that he is, uh, no. but, but he definitely is. And when you hear some of the numbers behind what he's managed to, to punch out from his potty, um, we are very excited that hopefully, unless and now that I'm saying in the public domain, it's going to be true, that Ryan might actually come down under to uh, LTMA 20 in February next year and run us. Oh, a twist my arm. Uh, run run a session for all of us Aussies as well. So um, without further ado, I'm going to throw over to Ryan to, to run the session. Ryan and I bumped into each other at XYPN, but before that we sort of knew each other through the FinCon bit and we bumped into each other and talked to, about a, a few other things. And the more we got talking, the more we realised that we had a crap load in common. Um, I had just started the Robo's podcast um, and was sort of faking it until I made it. And uh, I got Ryan on the show. I still haven't published his episode and he's going to be really filthy about that. Uh, he got me on. We recorded that in what, December? Listen, mate, don't, don't start. The, the time shifts all the time. But it's, look, I actually think I'm a really good example of what can happen when you don't fall. I love podcasting and I love what podcasting can do. I hate the podcasting process. So I want to talk to you today in particular about how do you find a way to either find love with the process? Because I think you, that, you might say that that's a fairly common thing as well. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Ryan because he knows a hundred times more about this than I do. I'm going to shut up. As always, guys, the rules, um, fire your questions through, use the, um, use the chat box, use the Q&A. I'm going, to, I'm going to hit Ryan up. And I know we've already got a, a question that you asked that you got asked offline mm -hmm. before the session started as well. So um, we'll answer these as we go. 
uh, over yep. to you, mate. Cool. Um, so I won't be able to see the chat window like when I share the yeah, screen. I'll, I'll shout out if, uh, if anyone starts throwing questions your way. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so I will share my screen. Give me a second here. Let's launch in here. All right, we good, Steve? On we are you good to go, bud. Cool. Okay, so guys, we're going to talk about podcasting and why it is absolutely amazing for an advisory business. Um, but most of you don't know who I am. So I am Ryan Inman. Um, I am the owner of Physician Wealth Services. That's my fee-only financial planning firm, uh, where uh, of course I work with physicians all across the U.S. And I am the host and creator of the Financial Residency Podcast, as well as the Physician Finance Minute. Um, and we're going to talk a lot today on, um, and I'll reference a lot on the Financial Residency Podcast, but the Physician Finance Minute, just in case you're wondering, you're like, why hasn't he touched on it? Uh, it's a daily podcast. It's a minute to a, maybe two minutes long. Um, and I bulk create that. And I can talk a little bit about that at the end when we're talking about like uh, content creation. Um, but it's fairly new. It launched in February um, and it's got maybe like six or 7,000 downloads now, but it's really only like 120 people listen, but they listen to like every show. Um, so it's, uh, I'm testing out another format of podcasting, um, but primarily we're going to talk on financial residency and how you guys can leverage podcasting to grow your guys' business. Um, so a couple of the things I wanted you guys to take away from this is why I think you need to be podcasting if you're not. Um, some of the must knows before starting, these are things that I wish I would have known. Um, and I've made lots and lots and lots of mistakes and it just happens. Um, how to actually design your show and just know that it's going to change a whole bunch as you start podcasting. Um, how to achieve growth. Um, I'll kind of show you how I did it. Um, when to really ask for help. And I think that's the level where Steve's at. He just doesn't know it yet, or maybe he does. Um, and then failures happen. And I'll tell you kind of some of the stuff that I failed with, but I really want you guys to ask questions throughout uh, the presentation because uh, it'll make it more entertaining and fun. And I want to make sure that you guys all walk away with, wow, that was really helpful. So with that, um, let's jump in. I am located in San Diego, but the reach is massive and I don't target an international audience by any means. I'm pretty sure it's people that travel abroad and then download it, but it's been heard in 114 countries, which still blows my mind because I probably don't even know all the countries that are on there. Geography is not my, my strong suit. Um, but to give you some stats and I, I talk about metrics that you need to follow, um, but downloads. So it launched in October, 2017. Uh, where I just checked today before we launched, it just clicked 155,000 downloads. And I'm getting now about a little over 2,500 downloads per show. Um, I created a community around the podcast. So it's not just me talking on the podcast. I do have guests. And then I, I give people a place to go. They can either come back to the blog that I have, or they can go to the community, which is made up of physicians or physician spouses. Because again, I'm only speaking to physicians. Um, and in that one specifically for the podcast, there's 1100, uh, doctors or spouses of doctors and in the physician finance Facebook group that I have, um, which is again, doctors or spouse of doctors, there's about 4,400 people in that one. Um, and then I want to talk about conversion and I will a little bit later on, but just for my stats, so you know, um, just in 2019 alone, uh, we have fielded 68 prospect meetings so far this year with probably another 14 or 15 on the books. And we just signed last week our 20th client this year. And I can tell you that did not happen prior to having a podcast um, or kind of the community around the podcast. So um, it's been life changing, amazing. And that's why I think everyone should be, should be really doing it. Uh, so why podcast? And I, I really believe this is to give your business a stage to be able to talk through um, who you are and what you're doing and what you think is important and valuable for that audience. And uh, the, the figure that I, I wanted to look up a couple things for you guys, because I'm not super familiar with the Australian podcast scene. Um, but 78% uh, is the number of Australians that are familiar with the term podcasting or listen to podcasts. 
that is huge. In the U.S., it's 68%. So uh, while the U.S. is obviously larger and has a much bigger population, um, more Australians are aware of podcasting. And what I found was fascinating was that it's not just a bunch of like college, broke college kids listening. Uh, the average, 15% of the people who listen to monthly podcasts in Australia make between a hundred and $150,000. So I don't know what you guys are targeting, who you're targeting for uh, your planning business, but anyone's making six figure income, I would assume has some market somewhere that you guys are all trying to pitch to. And 15% of the monthly downloads are those people uh, that they pulled. And I thought this little graph was really interesting on um, one of the places I was looking up uh, information um, because I could understand if you guys are saying, well, in the U.S. this is different because the U.S. is huge and you have a much bigger audience. Well, a third of Australia and a third of the U.S., the exact same number, are the percentage of respondents who listen to a podcast in the last month. So that's pretty huge. Now, obviously, it's sample size and what we're looking at with data, but that's huge. People are more aware of podcasting and people are listening to podcasts in Australia. And the, the stat that they have that iTunes gave out um, that, uh, that they were pulling this research from was that 80% of the people listen to seven episodes a week and they listen to all or most of each episode. And I'll talk a little bit more on like the all or most part in, the, in, in a little bit, um, but that's a really, really important statistic. So I think podcasting um, really helps build a brand. And the way that I've kind of done this and that I've seen is that prospect clients, when they actually book these meetings, when they know who I am, when they've heard how I speak, when they I've even had my wife on the show. So we, we talk about some personal stuff. Like we go through um, George Kinder's three questions, which I don't know if all you guys are familiar with, but those are really personal questions. And we talk about when we bought a house and what that was like. And we're deciding if we're going to buy bunk beds for our kids or not. And like people literally are commenting or sending me emails like, don't do it or do it. It was great. Um, but giving that personality, like it's really hard to build a brand and have people really excited to want to engage. But if you put yourself out there and talk through these things, like people latch onto your stories. And that's way more powerful than reading a blog post, in my opinion. Um, plus, people put you in their ears when they listen. Like either they're in the car and they're driving to work and you have their almost undivided attention, or they're going for a run and now you have their undivided attention because you're in their ears. Like it doesn't really get more personal than that. And for a brand to be able to do that, for a very low cost and it's just time, I think it's amazing. Um, so I think another stat will help kind of prove this point to you guys. And it's 11% versus 39%. And 11% are the percentage of conversions that I have with prospective clients over the last 18 months when they haven't heard my podcast. 39% is the conversion rate I have when someone says that they've listened to one of my shows or more. So I'm getting th over three times more conversion if someone happened to have heard my show or binged listen to my show for a couple of weeks before they reached out or before they booked a prospective meeting. So, so my, what stage in the process is that, uh, is that conversion measured off? Is it like just absolute base level generic inquiry? Hey, I saw your thing can you help me out with stuff like right at the front end? Yeah. It's so when someone can, so I use Calendly, it's a software that allows me to book uh, meetings online and they can just go in and change their meetings, whatever. So when I actually have a meeting, I'm talking to Steve as the prospective client. I'm 11, I'm converting 11% of those meetings. If Steve's like, I had no idea you had a podcast. I just heard about you from XYZ ad or found you on nap for XYPN. But if Steve says, yeah, I've, I know you have a podcast. I've listened to a show or I've listened to, I binge listen. I listen to all your shows. Can't wait. They're awesome. Then I convert 39% of those. So it's, I'm actually finding out when they book an actual prospective meeting with, uh, with me um, and the conversion it's, it's to the point now where I don't like working with people who don't even listen to the podcast Yeah, because the perspective like meetings, and I don't know how you guys go through yours or what it's like. There's no pitching of who I am, my services, what I do, they already know all that. They know who I am. They know my stories. I get it all the time. 
is it weird that I feel like I know you way more than you know us right now? And this is the first time we're talking. I'm like, no, I have 68 shows that are out. I brought my wife on a few times. Like I tell stories all the time. It's perfectly natural that you know me better. Hopefully I'll get to know you better if we work together. But that's the conversion. That's the, the conversations I'm having. They're asking maybe what is your price? Like what does it cost to work with you? But it's not like, tell me your background. Where'd you go to school? What degrees do you, how long you've been working? Like, I don't get any of those anymore. Before the podcast I did, and it was really hard to divert back to like, well, why are you reaching out? But now with the podcast, there's none of that. It comes to, why did you reach out? Have you heard the, the show? Like, tell me a little bit about yourself. And there's no kind of the other direction of like, prove you're, prove you're worthy to, to, to work with us. It's kind of the other way around. Yeah, and, and I kind of think I, I reckon the um there'd be quite a few. Look, I would look at I'd look at those conversion numbers and and the cynic would go, shit, mate, that's fairly low. But when you then magnify that, because I think a lot of Aussies would a lot of the Aussies planners would go, oh, I'm targeting a higher conversion. And I think, you know, our own business is an example of that. But that's mm-hmm. like two referrals a month and, and they're all client referrals. The, yours is sort of socially sourced way out yeah, in the so uh, so we've like done 60, if you converted 80 percent, you you'd blow up well think about it like we've we're, we've done 68 or 69 prospect mm-hmm. meetings i forget the number i had on here but it, it's high 60s um you know the, if i had a 50 percent conversion rate like i'm already busy and overwhelmed taking on 20 new clients so you could tell me hey my conversion rate 60 percent. i'm doing a good job and i'll say did you sign 20 new clients you know, it's, it's, oh no, I signed two. It's like, okay, well, I hope your conversion rates high. Otherwise you're going to be kind of hurting, but how about we just increase the top of the funnel to where you have 10 or 15 or 20. And some of the, the, one of the downsides with the podcast that I will say from this point is that um, they're all doctors uh, and they're all, or married to doctors, but sometimes I'm hitting them too early in the cycle. And meaning um, they go through, uh, medical school for four years, they go through residency for three years, and then some of them go three years more of fellowship. In med school, they make nothing. In residency, they're making like $50,000, but they have $300,000 of debt. They really can't afford to work with me. And then when they finally become an attending or like an actual like practicing out without doing more training, that's when I want to like hit them. But some of them find me early through the podcast. And so I'm right now, I've been basically saying, um, I'm too busy. I can't take on hourly planning work to help you through one or two issues. Um, here's a bunch of good free resources, but I'm starting to work through and evolving and I'll talk a little more on it. Um, uh, basically a membership site that residents can, can join in. So if I stripped out the residents, you could almost, uh, I, I think at least increase these by 30%. Mm. So Peter's already said these conversion numbers are through the roof, as you'd expect for a for a a, um, a sort of cold reach, semi warm referral. Um, and Christopher Chris has asked, how long did you rush? Was it a gradual sort of eleven percent up to thirty nine incremental improvement, or was it like eleven, 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 eleven? One day, amazing episode, flick the switch, bang, up to thirty nine. Oh, I so wish it was that. No, this has been like the grind from eleven to 15, to 17, to 20, to 20. Like it was, it's taken time. And um, 39%, this is Q1 of this year. Um, so that, that's the data that I kind of have. Uh, well, I think you've definitely piqued everybody's interest, mate. You're smashing the downloads and it's immediately converting into new business. All you, all you got to do now is teach us how to be like you. Well, hopefully we can keep going and you guys can, can ask more questions. But um, I can tell you from a personal thing it took me more than a year to actually pull the trigger to do a podcast and uh steve you can run the answers and i don't know how you actually do the poll but yeah i'm doing that i'm just going live with that poll now guys so um we've got a couple of we've got two polls in one today so we're sort of uh and and ryan will reveal the the reason for the second question in the poll yep later on but any of you that haven't done a uh, that are first first timers on our webinars and polls before Minimum 75% response rate. The advice movement is all about taking action and getting off your ass. So unless you are driving a motor vehicle on the left-hand side or the right-hand side of the road and you can legally not enter answers to the poll, you need to enter your answers to the poll. Because if we don't get to 75%, 
we're just going to sit here uh, and we'll wait. And oh, uh, we'll, I should have selected an answer. <laughs> no, you're good. No, we're not going to bump these numbers yeah. up. We want, and it's good. We're slowly <laughs> creeping. Half of you have given us an answer so far. So I'm just waiting on a, another half dozen of you to, to kick us over into that 75% zone and then we're good to go. Um, the numbers are starting to come through. 15 of, we're nearly at 68%. Just waiting on a couple more to get us over the line. Oh, I think we need one more to hit 75 if you haven't answered yet. Um, there was no option, Brett Evans. Very good on people that have already started. So we'll, uh, we'll note that down that you may have already started or you have already yep. started. One more person, come on. One more vote's going to get us up to the 75% mark. I really don't want to be sitting here <laughs> hanging here all day on that one. We might have six people driving. So I'm going to just, for the first time in history, I'm going to publish this poll results uh, south of 75%. Oh, boy. Uh, good so we're going to do this. We're going to go. All right. So you should be seeing those poll results live, Ryan. Can you see them on your end or no? No, I can't see Okay, them. I'm going to read them to you. Yeah, just read them to me. I'm going to go old school. Um, and so question one, obviously what has held you back from starting a podcast, uh, multiple choice. Obviously this doesn't apply to people that have already started a podcast because the answer would be nothing. I've already started yep. a podcast, but for those that haven't vast majority of our audience, um, 14 out of 16, no shock, 88% having trouble understanding how to do it. Um, okay. a small percentage, 6% think it's a waste of time and you're busy marketing in other places, which is, um, interesting that you're on this webinar, um, fear, maybe you're hoping to find out that it's not a waste of time. So fear, uh, 20% of people think that 13% think it's the cost. Um, and the process around the process flow and sorry, using workflow management, uh, 56% mm -hmm. have got it and use it and their business would fall apart without it. 25% have got it, but they rarely use it. Um, and on a few have never even tried it. So 20% of people haven't even used workflow management. So that is, that's an interesting one okay. there as well. So those are those results. I'm oh, just flashing. Now I can see the results. Yeah, you know, so it's, it's, it's not like Steve's done, uh, you know, about, 20 of these webinars and, uh, and should have known that he should have just flicked the button. Anyway, guys, you don't pay me for my webinar button clicking ability. You pay Apparently. me for my amazing guests. So oh, on that note, we're going to, we're going to keep, we're going to keep trucking, uh, Ryan over to you. Yeah. Awesome. So I can tell you guys, my answer was fear. Um, I am not the super outgoing extroverted person. And I th kind of thinking like, well, if I put this out and, what if I get called out on something? What if someone uh, disagrees? So what if someone, you know, doesn't share it or says a negative comment? Like one, it happens and you're going to fail a bunch of times. So you just got to get over it. But it took me a whole year uh, to end up uh, actually pushing uh, the podcast. I kind of am kicking myself going like, well, I wonder what this would have been like with an extra 12 months um, on this. Cause it literally was 12 to 13 months that it took me. So, uh, but that's really interesting that it, the bulk of you uh, don't have the fear and it's more of just what do we need to know? Uh, so we're going to kind of dive into some of the things that I wish I knew when I was starting with the podcast and for how many Steve was it that thought it was too expensive? Uh, I'll grab that number for you, mate. Let's have a look. Uh, it was like 13%, 13% thought it was too expensive. Okay. So they're going to get excited by the next slide. Um, so there's a cost involved. Uh, there's critical metrics to follow and understanding how you're going to monetize your show. Like those are the, basically the three things that I wish I could have figured out and understood and had someone tell me like right off the bat. Um, so the people who thought it would be too expensive, you can literally do it for under $250. Like not a joke. Like that mic, the audio technica 20 ATR 2100. I use that for 50 shows. And it was a $60 mic that I bought on Amazon. Uh, there was a stand that came with it, um, but I paid a little bit extra money, like $9.99, like $9 uh, to buy the bigger stand. Um, and then there was some cabling that I had to buy uh, for it. And 
one of the things that most people cheap out on is headphones. They just don't get them and it sounds terrible because usually there's like a feedback loop. Just buy a set of headphones. You could literally use the ones that came with your phones, like anything, just put headphones in. Um, otherwise your sound is going to be terrible and it's going to be really hard to edit. Um, for the software involved, this is where people mostly get confused. So there's plenty of places that you can do hosting, just like you would host your website somewhere. You want to host your podcast somewhere. Uh, Libsyn, literally you can start with them for $5 a month. And, and no one's getting paid for that. This is just like the free or the cheap stuff that I know that you could use. Um, but if you want to have access to the stats, it's an extra couple bucks, I think like two bucks more a month. And you'll be fine with it um, unless you're bulk recording like 10 shows a month and most people aren't doing that. So um, Libsyn, 84 bucks. Zencaster, so if you are having a show that has guests on it, you will want to use something called Zencaster and you could literally do the free version if you're just gonna do a couple shows a month. Again, if you're, this is how they actually make money that if you're gonna have you know, two shows a week go out, then you want to pay for their, their premium version, which I think is like 20 bucks a month. Um, and then Audacity, if you're recording solo, uh, you can use Audacity to record directly into your computer from the mic that you bought that you connected in. Um, if you are editing your show, you can edit everything through Audacity. And there's some try like, you know, there's different videos. YouTube can probably show you pretty quickly how to edit uh, from a very basic knowledge way. Um, but two of the softwares are free and one cost $84 a year. So all this all together, you could literally start this for $250 under actually $250. Mate, I've got a question already for one of our crew that um, Brett Evans, who already has his own show, but he wants to know if you can change from SoundCloud to Libsyn as the host platform. I know this is a pretty common one. People go all in on one hosting platform and then they go, oh shit, it's, maybe it's not for me and they want to switch. What's your experience yep. with maybe switching platforms? So I actually haven't switched from a platform, but I know that the person who I've hired the, to help edit and kind of help manage some of the show um, has helped tons and tons of people do that. Um, it's not that difficult. It just takes some time and you need to contact support probably. Um, if you're going to go it on your own, try to figure it out. Um, just contact, sign up for Libsyn, contact them and say, hey, I want to port this show from this area over to here. Here's the RSS feeds. How do I kind of set this up? And they'll kind of handhold you and get you on their platform, especially if you're paying them money. Uh, they'd love to, to help you and switch over. So um, it's, it's pretty easy though. It's not, it's not like the end of the world. Oh, thanks, man. I like switching, switching a, a website. So the metrics that matter, and you'll notice uh, these look familiar from earlier, but essentially the three things I think you need to pay attention to, um, and in not necessarily any order, but are downloads, like who's basically paying attention? Um, you know, where are they coming from? Are you getting increasing more downloads? Um, I'd look at it over a four week period, um, day to day or week by week, doesn't really matter. Uh, monthly downloads are nice to understand just from a macro level, like are you increasing? Uh, you went from 6,000 a month to 7,000 or whatever it may be, like, that's awesome. Find out if it's one show or a particular topic that most people are interested in and you can usually tell that by the downloads. Um, what is also interesting is if your title sucks or if your title is really good, you might actually entice more downloads or less downloads if your title is bad. Um, and I've actually gone in and fixed the titles and then actually seeing a boost in uh, traffic to those ones because new subscribers, like if you were to listen to my show right now, you're probably gonna download the last one, but then you'll probably f like scroll through and be like, oh, that sounds interesting. So people are choosing stuff by the title. So if your titles suck, then you will end up seeing that in your download numbers. Uh, the second one I think you need to pay attention to is the community around it. Find out who's participating and give them an avenue to, to participate in. This could be pushing everyone back to your blog um, and encouraging to write comments. This could be encouraging everyone to go to a Facebook group. Um, that's what I actually chose to do. It was the easiest form for me to build the community. And at some point I will move it off of Facebook, but I don't feel like my communities are big enough yet uh, in order to do that. But at some point I will, um, but it's been really easy. Um, there's a plugin for WordPress. Uh, it's called Pretty Links and it allows you to essentially um, create a pretty link by 
saying whatever the ugly Facebook link would be is I just say go to financialresidency.com slash community and you'll be able to join our group of over a thousand physicians or spouses of physicians trying to get, you know, take control over their money. And that literally ports them right over. So they're learning the domain, which is my domain, um, but it's taking them directly to where it's going. So figuring out who's participating and continually asking what kind of content do you actually want to hear? Do you want to see? Um, you will get that from the community and then conversions. Like who are the people who actually want to work with you? Um, I think conversions are huge and to understand um, the, the numbers of that and we're all planners. So like you're going to definitely do deep dives, but just make sure that you're tracking the appropriate data and to kind of reference it back. These were my numbers that I shared with you in the beginning. Um, so 150,000 downloads, 500 or 5,000 plus in the community and 20 clients so far this year. Um, so now we're going to go to like, how do you actually monetize this? And I think there's two ways to look at this. And most of us are trapped into your business advisory services. And that is totally fine if that's where you're going to go and that's where it stops. Um, somewhere like Steve, what Steve's building would not just be advisory services. It might be other things. Um, but it's either your business that you're promoting or other people's businesses. Um, and when we listen to podcasts, we hear ads all the time. Um, that could be great. I actually just got hit up by Airbnb to sponsor my show and I'm still toying like, do I want to run an ad on my show for something that's not one of my businesses? Uh, that to me is a very tough thing. And I would never have dreamed that someone would want to pay me money for my podcast. I was just happy that people actually listen to it. Um, but you have to understand, are you going into this trying to make money with ads or affiliate marketing, which is like, Hey, I use this awesome service. You should check it out. And then you get, uh, you know, some type of commission back on it. Um, I don't do affiliate marketing. I don't like that really at all. Um, I primarily promote back to the advisory services, uh, type of business. And we do have a book coming out at the end of 2019 and I will be promoting the book on the show. Um, but that's basically it right now. Uh, but just understanding the ways to monetize. Um, and I did kind of hint at the membership site uh, before, and that is because the, some of the prospects that are finding us are just not at the ability to pay our fees. Uh, and that's okay. They're the right type of client. They're just one to four years too early. And I'm sending them back to a bunch of free content, but I'm thinking that I could use that and kind of repurpose free content and give them maybe some webinars or something like that once a month and have them pay like a small monthly fee to be a part of a membership site. So I can, they're basically paying me to market back to them. And all the while I'm giving them great advice to hopefully fix any of the potential errors that they would have. So show design I think is really important. And some of you might be sitting here thinking like, I want to do a show, but I just have no idea like what to do or how it works and like how I would even think of one. And I can tell you like my avatar was really easy for me. The other two are really hard. Some people, the avatar is going to be really hard and the format will be easy. Like everyone's different, but my avatar was essentially who was my ideal client. Um, I work with physicians all across the country. Uh, I'm married to a physician. I know exactly what they're thinking, what they're doing, because that was us uh, the whole way through, through medical school and residency and all that. So it was really easy to be like, well, the content that all of our friends are asking me is these 12 questions. Well, here's the first 12 shows that I'm going to do. And then I was thinking like, I'm going to bring on guests to kind of break up the mix. So it's not me talking for 30 or 40 minutes and People may be feeling bored or whatever it may be. Really, that was just insecurity and the fear of getting me to actually podcast. Um, knowing what I know now, uh, guests are, it's really, really tough because you don't just say, hey, Steve, would you come on my show? Like, and that's it. And you're just going to wing it. No, you want to research Steve and what he's doing. You know, I took the course. I went through his stuff. Like we went in detail when I actually had Steve on the show. We actually broke it up into two shows. We had such a good time talking about stuff. Um, and everyone loved his accent, of course, but I made sure that I did research on Steve before I brought him on. It wasn't just kind of winging it. And that takes a lot of time and effort to research someone to make sure it's a good show and then to actually book the right times and get everyone coordinated. It's a lot of, a lot of hassle, if you will, but I think it's well worth it. Um, but selecting the right guests, 
preparing for the guests. Um, and then you've got, you know, prior to recording, sending messages like, hey, make sure you're in a quiet spot. Make sure that you've got this going on. Make sure you're free of distractions. And then post recording, like the follow up. Steve, thanks so much for being on the show. You know, I'm pushing this content out on May 1st. You know, sorry for the social spam. I'm going to be tagging you to a bunch of stuff. Um, you know, sorry to give you free publicity. Um, but making sure you're following up with people, like there's a lot that goes into the guest interviews. And that is something that I did not think about or know. Um, so if you are thinking about doing a guest show, just think uh, further down the road, do you want to be coordinating with people and, all the time? And you can mix and match your shows, but consistency is really key. And I'm going to show you a graph and you're going to see where consistency was key, at least in producing content. Um, and I think, Steve, that's when you can chime in with uh, what you have going on with your show. Um, but the format, and this, I think, for me, is the toughest part um, of the entire process. It's understanding how to put together a good show. So this is exactly what I have right now on the Financial Residency Podcast. Um, it has changed several times. And this is the part where, you, 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 what I said, uh, you're going to try things and fail and go back. I definitely tried a lot of different things and I've failed with a lot. Some of them work, some of them didn't work. Um, but I broke it into basically four points from my show. So I need to pique the interest. And there's a stat somewhere uh, that I actually heard through Podcast Movement, um, which is a giant conference just for podcasters. And it's not just made up of advisors. Advisors are like 0.01% of their, of their attendees. But uh, you have less than two minutes from when you say, hi and welcome to the show, to jumping into the content, you have less than two minutes for someone to understand what you're doing and to get into your content before they leave. And if they leave, they never come back. So you have less than two minutes to jump in. So how can you pique their interest to get them to want to stay to where you can deliver that high quality content that you're producing the show on? Um, so I ask a teaser question. I do the trailer intro. I read it every time. Uh, that has been way more effective than having a voiceover. Uh, the voiceover, um, it was, she was called a cheesy announcer lady, um, all sorts of stuff uh, by, by fans of the show now. Um, so now I read my same intro. Um, it's in my voice. The changes, sometimes I'll say a word differently or pause somewhere different and people know that I read it every time and they actually notice and comment on that. Um, and then I go into a formal intro. We're going to bring Steve on today. We're going to be talking about budgeting. It's going to be amazing. Da, 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 da. And then I'm jumping into the show within two minutes. And that piece was hard for me to figure out because my first shows, it was four minutes, five minutes before I was really jumping in the content. And I was losing people. Like I already know. And that's okay. I made the mistakes when it was smaller. Um, but now I'm going to deliver hopefully high quality content to them. And then Remember that stat where I said 80% of the people listen to all or most of the show? Well, I want to basically have the intro and the high quality content. Like that's the most important stuff that I want people to hear. So I package some stuff at the end of the show to make the show technically longer. And that means make sure that my, my guest and what we're trying to go over in that show is heard completely. Because if they listen to, let's say, 75 or 80% of the show, that's all of my intro and all of my interview. Cause I'll do stuff for the community at the end. So the people who really want to be a part of the community and understand what's going on and to hopefully take some action, they're already going to listen to the whole show. So I put it towards the end. Um, I highlight an article. Um, I, and I'm going to talk about influencers in a little bit in your space, but I, I can relay it back to, to me and physicians. So I highlight one of the bloggers or podcasters out there that are physicians or they're speaking to physicians that are not financial advisors and I want to highlight what they're doing and comment on their article. And doctors have this thing called journal club that they do. They get, you know, together once a month and they'll find some journal that, uh, you know, in the journal of medicine that they liked and they wanted to share with the group. Well, I do that every week and I do it as a, a basically as a segment in the show and I'll read little bits and clips of it. And then I give them a community update. Like I just, the last one, I just teased out that um, I just signed with a publisher and the book is coming. Um, most people who are, don't want to be a part of the community aren't going to care about that if I put it in the beginning. If they don't want to be a part of the community, they're not going to care if I have a book or not. The people who are listening definitely are going to care the, uh, at the end. So that's where I'm, I'm putting it. And then I do a recap of the show. So what are the takeaways that I want them to learn from the show? 
Uh, so I have five takeaways and I'll play like a 10 or maybe 15 second clip of Steve giving some really awesome, awesome, you know, uh, tidbits of information. And I'll maybe say a one sentence or two sentence intro to say like, you know, when Steve said something, a blah, 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 it was really, really interesting. It's a key takeaway. And then we'll play the clip. Um, I give my normal disclaimer, but I try to make them fun. And, and then I give an outro, um, to tease out the next show. So thanks for listening. Here's what's going on next show. And this format has changed a ton. Um, but if you're like me and you are going to have a lot of trouble with this, um, the way I look at this is like imitation is the serious, sincerest form of flattery. Go find 20 shows that you like. Take one thing that they do really well. Change it a little bit to make it yours. But then that's in combined it all and that could be your show. So I really like the way that Ryan does his intro, but I really like the way that Steve does his outro. And I really like the disclaimer piece here. And you can pick and choose little bits from everyone. And again, don't copy completely, but make the idea your own by making a slight tweak or a slight change, mash it all together. And you're probably gonna have a pretty kick-ass show. So if you have trouble with the format, that would be my kind of hack to uh, making sure that you can at least get something going. So um, Steve, if we had any more questions, cause I can't see as it comes in. Yeah, we have mate. And uh, I'm going to ask one now from uh, John who, and, and, and Peter's got a few. <laughs> Peter wants a one-on-one -on -one personal coaching session, which you're going to give at the end of this for a few minutes. Uh, so okay. I'm not going to ask any of Peter's questions because Peter will, uh, Peter's amazing and you'll find out when you meet her in uh, at XYPN this year. But uh, John's question is, is there an ideal podcast time length that you have seen more success with? Yeah. So um, the way I look at this is I treat most people are in the car or on a run. Uh, I don't know many people who run for an hour and a half and I don't know many people who like to do a 10 minute sprint. So uh, I typically look at it as like 30 minutes is probably a good length to 40 minutes. Um, that's what most commutes are in, in the US. I'm not sure about Australia. Um, Steve, do you know how long most people can Yeah, it's about the time. Anything more than 30 minutes and the kangaroos get tired and then you've got to jump off. So yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty standard. Okay, okay so, so 30 minutes would be like the hard cutoff. Um, I like going a little bit more than that because most people listen at like 1.2 speed or 1.4 speed or something. So you can get it within a whole commute. That would be my goal. Um, so Steve gets in his car, he pops on the podcast, he drives to work. And by the time he's at work, he's done. Uh, that would be ideal. Cause then on the way home, they can hopefully listen to another one. Uh, if you're multiple shoot, like if it goes an hour and a half long, I think Steve, what did we record for? We recorded for almost an hour and a half. I like a week. No, you couldn't shut me. Sh you couldn't shut me I up. Couldn't get him to shut up. So what we ended up, and it was all really good. And I was like thinking about how could I edit this? And I was like, I don't want to, like, this was really, really good stuff. Uh, so no joke. I release on Mondays and uh, for Steve, I released Monday, half the show and then Tuesday, the second half. And it actually double dipped the downloads. It was one call and it was re a really, really beneficial call. I get tons of feedback um, all the time on that, on that podcast. And uh, yeah, so I, I would look at it as probably like 30, to 40 minutes is probably a good uh, time frame. Awesome. Now, Madam Conscious, we do technically only have 15, but like most of our webinars, we'll, we'll stick on for the, we'll hang on for the true believers as long as Ryan doesn't need to go and uh, get the crap yep. or whatever else. Yeah. You're good. You crazy Vegas yeah. kids get up to. Oh man, out of control. All right. You want me to keep going? Yes, please, bud. Okay. So I think there's a couple of keys to growth and um, they might not be the traditional ones you could Google online. Um, I think you definitely have to have a process and a procedure of, of how you tackle this, almost treating it like you're onboarding a new client. What are you doing in that, uh, that aspect? And that was why we asked that other poll question. Um, I think having relationships with people that are influencers or in the media, ways to maybe get quotes or, or link backs or um, ways to have people highlight your content are really, really good. Um, and that, that journal club that I mentioned before, think about this. I'm producing a show with Steve. No one, it, no physician in America knows Steve. That's totally cool. They got a lot of great content from Steve. But when I said, oh, and today's journal club is from XYZ, you know, dot com, and that was a, another blogger, they get excited because now one of their things was mentioned. So of course, they're either going to listen to the show or they'll fast forward to hear what I said about them. 
but then they're likely to share it out with their audience. So I want you to think about who in your kind of realm, uh, you know, if, of the ideal client or that avatar could help you spread the growth by just giving back and highlighting them and then consistency. And I think this is going to be a fun one where, uh, you know, I kind of pull back the curtain and be like, show me where I was consistent um, in this. So this was that poll question. Um, but let's, let's go into process really quick. So um, I use a software called Asana. Um, when I decided to hire someone, um, I created a separate Asana um, from my financial planning business that I do for the podcast itself. And this is where we keep basically a formal process for everything that we do for the show. And my thought was, I just want to teach this person what I do and how I do it, and then let them run with the pieces that they need to go through. And so I just started tracking everything. I didn't have this in place. And all of a sudden I started tracking it all and it became way more efficient um, to the point now where we literally are producing two shows a week um, because we're so much more efficient. I'm doing the same amount, probably even less time uh, than that. And I'm kind of kicking myself thinking like, why did it take me so long to implement this? Uh, when I know like from a financial planning side, onboarding new clients is really easy because this is, we have a process. Why didn't I think about it from the podcast itself? Um, so formal written process was huge. And I think the next shift with that, when I started to lay it all out, was understanding the batch recording piece. So I batch record as much as I can. So if I'm going to have three podcasts, I'm going to have them all on the same day, try to line up everyone's interview at the, like one after another. It's a tiring day, but that's three weeks of content basically done. And then I will do their intros, outros, recaps, journal clubs, I'll batch all that in one process together. So I'm not sitting there trying to produce like the content for one show and only one show. I'll write several intros, I'll write several outros um, and just make sure that I have the, the shows lined up and I pre-plan the shows so I know who's going to be next. And I, um, I think I am now recording. So we're mid-April. I think I'm recorded through May. Um, so I'm about a month and a half ahead of content. Um, and unlike Steve, when I interview someone, I actually do publish their show. That's oh. probably the reason. Oh, ouch. So um, true though. So true. So the third point here that I wrote is like scripting and outlining. And so when you're thinking in batch, it'd be kind of hard to go, well, how can I batch four shows of intros and outros and recaps without listening to the whole show again? And so what I did was, is when I record a show, let's say it was with Steve, I write down a couple points, like right at the end of the show, we're done. I clicked end. I say, thanks Steve for being on. See ya. And I immediately write down a couple things that I like and want to talk about. And then I'll actually, now I have someone to help me through this. They'll go in and they'll pull timestamps of the things I thought were really beneficial with Steve's call. Um, and then we'll kind of script a little bit so I can just read this intro, outro recap. And then it's all combined together in post editing. Um, and then deciding to actually hire someone. Um, I think I mentioned in a future slide, but I, I hired them when I basically hit a thousand downloads a show. And that was like, I, I've been doing this from like mental roadblocks. Um, you know, when I hit 50 shows, I'll spend a little bit more money and get a better mic. When I hit a thousand dollars a show, I'll hire someone to help me. Um, it didn't mean that that was the best way to do it. It's just the way that I did it. Um, but it was really helpful once I did have that person to start defining what roles that they do and what roles that I do. And it's similar to what you probably do in your planning business. Um, just writing down this process and how it'll work for you. Um, and I've mentioned this before in a few points, but like who's already in front of your audience, who has the same demographic? So in my case, who are the people who are talking to physicians? It's a lot of these other physician bloggers and podcasters. So how can I, leverage their talents and their resources and their communities to come back to mine. And instead of saying, Hey, Steve, I know you've got a whole bunch of advisors you talk to. I'd love to create this. Will you mention it to them? I'd be like, no, instead I'll go and say, wow, this is really great content from Steve. Check it out. And I actually put it in the show. And once I put it in the show, they were way more receptive to like, then give back. And that's, I think what attributed to, uh, a lot of the growth, um, just kind of compounding. So every week I'm, I'm giving a new person, um, some props for a really great show or a really great, uh, blog post, reading it, giving a link back on my site, um, and trying to build it. So who's already in front of that audience that you can leverage. 
And then this is the great graph that I wanted to, to show you guys. So guess when I actually became consistent with the podcast. Can you tell Steve? Oh, I'm going to go uh, around September of probably 2018. Yep, pretty much. So, and if you can look in the very beginning, like I started in October, uh, the graph only shows November because that's the way Lips and Stats worked. Um, but you can see I didn't hit 500 downloads till like basically the end of April, like 500 downloads in a, sh in a, in a day, not just a show in a day. And that it takes a long time. So part of this, I want to show you guys, like it doesn't happen overnight. It's not one show and, Oh, you had a killer show and brought on X, Y, Z guest. I'm pretty sure if I brought on someone like Oprah or something, my downloads go through the number through the roof and then go back to normal because her listeners just want to listen to her. But if I had, um, just one magic show, you'd see a huge spike, but instead you don't see it. You see slow growth all the way through. Um, I took the summer off and said, this is the end of season one. Season two is starting. And that I think allowed people to understand and digest some of the older content. But then when I re-released, I had three shows in one week and I brought on um, some really good guests, but I hit on a lot of these points that I had been studying and learning. Cause I took basically two months we moved but I studied a ton and was like, where's my audience at? What content do they want? I started re reaching out and emailing people that were in our community and asking our community, like, what can I do for you guys to make this better? How can I have this content be better? Um, it's not like I asked for people to share the episode or it's not like I brought on sponsors. Like I literally from September, I haven't missed a week. I've been very consistent and you can see the show is growing and now we're just hitting like, over 1500 downloads a day um, in, in, in the release days. Um, but even our non-release days like are hitting uh, anywhere from you know, three to 600, uh, which is huge. That adds quite a bit of downloads to it. So um, consistency is key. And Steve, I think this is where you might be able to benefit from is the consistency piece. Yes, absolutely, bud. We'll, uh, we'll talk about how we fix my train wreck yeah. show in a second. So, yeah. So some growth hacks. Um, these are kind of things that I think as I understand podcasting more that uh, I wish I would have known ahead of time, being a guest on other people's shows that have similar audiences to you, uh, but aren't competitors of yours. So like, don't go to another advisor's podcast and try to hope to get on. That's probably not going to work, but trying to understand um, you know, okay, for doctors, who else are they listening to? And then try to go get on those shows. It's similar to writing a guest post for a blog. You are guesting on someone's show. They already understand podcasting. They already listen. It's super easy for them to be like, wow, Steve was really valuable. I'm just going to go search for his podcast and click subscribe. So that's probably the number one way you're going to get a bigger audience is just being on other people's show. Uh, repurposing the content. So um, you probably have seen on the internet now, um, these like either static images or they're like rotating images with these like little squiggly bars. And it's like a minute or a minute and a half of content there. What you're doing is you're taking like 30, you know, 30 seconds to 90 seconds, something in your podcast, you're throwing on a few images and you're basically putting out a short little video of your podcast in a clip. Huge um, way. I, sometimes we've, we haven't done it as many of those recently, but sometimes I get like a thousand, I don't even have that many followers on Instagram, but sometimes I'll get like a thousand people that listened to this clip because it like got shared somewhere and went somewhere when I know that like the show only had a thousand downloads or 800 downloads. Um, so they were able to watch that little clip and it's just building the brand awareness and who knows, maybe some of those people weren't subscribers. I went and subscribed, um, which is what I'm kind of hoping on. And I think actually worked and fueled some of the growth. Um, I've talked on the, the influencer piece, but just highlighting their content again really helps. And then search engine optimization. Uh, don't just take a, if you have a, a, a website, uh, which I would highly suggest you do because through SEO, you will be found um, in, in those will drive listeners back to you. Um, but don't just take a transcript of your show and throw it on, on your website. It doesn't do any good. Um, we actually have someone now um, that's, that's on our team that they will take a transcript, but then they'll go and they'll create a blog post out of it. So it will read just like a blog post, but is everything that the guest and I covered in the show itself, it just reads a lot differently. And Google really likes that. 
Um, and they tend to be a 30 minute show tends to be about 3000, 2,500 words. And that's like the optimal length for Google. So a lot of my podcast episodes are being found in ranking, like some in the top spots uh, for certain like longer tail keywords, uh, which is kind of crazy um, to think that show notes are ranking, um, but it brings in listeners. And on the top of every one of those posts, I have the free Libsyn player. That's just a little code that Libsyn gives you. And they can literally listen on the website if they want. Um, and then I wanted, I, I showed you guys the chart, but just to kind of outline like how this has been over the past year and a half or so. Um, so when I started the show, it was just myself and I did everything and um, which was fine. And it took about three months, maybe closer to four months to hit 200 downloads a show. Uh, and I think that um, just being realistic with how many downloads you're going to get in the beginning, because it's hard to be found and it takes time, just like search engine optimization and ranking in Google takes a long time. Like it does take a while for the indexing to work in your favor. Um, it took about seven months to hit a thousand downloads a show. And that's when I decided for me to find some help. And right now we are on track to hit a uh, quarter of a million downloads um, before October of 2019. So the growth happens, but as you saw on that chart, it goes up exponentially, starts to grow on itself. Uh, which has been been pretty fun to see uh, the growth. And so I've mentioned a bunch of times on how you can, who you should hire and what it should look like. So here's all the people that help me. They're not all full-time people. Some uh, of this are one person, but this is what they excel in. Um, so I've got someone that supports me in a ton of different ways um, and handles kind of my social presence. Um, I have an editor for the blogs itself. So like I said, we get a transcript, they write it and edit it. Um, I've got an audio editor because I absolutely hate editing audio. Uh, that just was something I did not enjoy at all. Um, I've got a graphics person and I've got someone who's just now been reaching out more proactively, trying to get me on more shows or trying to reach out to um, guests of, that have been on other shows uh, to try to get them to be guests on my show. So it's not just me anymore. Um, you know, this will, this part costs you more money. Um, it's not under $250, uh, to, to just do it. But when you're starting out, you don't need all of this. Like you can wear all the hats, um, but just, you'll have to know when that help kind of occurs. And for me, it was that mental roadblock of when I hit a thousand downloads a show, I will feel like I made it enough that I can start spending more money on this. Um, and that's what I did. Some, if you have a bigger budget, spend it early and spend more time writing the content um, and, and creating the content. Cause that's something you can't outsource. And uh, what I want to leave you guys with is basically shit happens. You're going to try a ton of different stuff. Uh, a lot of things are going to fail. Just keep going. You're going to have tech fails. You're going to have uh, pieces in the show that are, are not going to do as well. You're going to say something in the show that someone doesn't like. Um, you're going to get some one star ratings for absolutely no reason it happens. So just plow through it. The show goes on. Just make sure that you're putting out your best stuff that you can, um, but don't try to be perfect because it will never be perfect or you'll never launch. And I think my last thing I want to say before we open it back to questions is if you're part of that in the fear crowd, like just push through, like it's so much better when you do and just get a little bit outside your comfort zone. We can, unlike this where I'm just talking and it's unedited, the podcast, you could cough, you could sneeze, you can get up and go get coffee, whatever, leave it all recording. And it's two seconds, it's all edited out. So uh, with that, here's kind of how to get a hold of me if you want to ask questions. And, um, you know, thanks so much for, for having me and uh, look forward to meeting all of you in uh, February. Uh, so that is a huge, mate, this has been a belter of a show. Uh, that's a good thing, by the way, just again, translating for the, uh, for, for my, my friends across the, across the pond. Um, and apart from it being my own personal get off your ass and fix your friggin' podcast coaching session, there's a heap of questions that we're going to try and get through as many as we can now, guys. I know Ryan, are you cool to hang for a few minutes while? Yeah, I've got a little bit more time. All right. Sweet. Can I see the questions? Like if I stop sharing, would that be okay? I reckon if you do, you should be able to see them, but uh, we'll see how we go. If not, we'll, um, we'll chuck it back up. Hopefully you can see it. Just okay. click on the chat button, but we'll read through these. 
No. Uh, but you're spot on with like, I need my own ass kicking. I got up to, I want to say I got up to, I've been going for, I'm looking at my blueberry stats now, which is one of the other hosting sites. And I'd literally yep. gone in for, I'd been doing it for five months and got to 1,262 downloads for September and then went, oh, this is tiring. Um, and then just like shit happens, right? And, and I was recording and editing and getting guests and doing all of that stuff. And then it just, yep. it just gets hard, right? And I, and, and I found excuses because I just went, well, you know, there's, there's other things I could be spending my time on. And, and crap happens in the business and you stop. How do you know when, because it's a bunch of the listeners that a bunch of our crew that are listening that are already sort of getting ready for doing stuff and then some that are already doing it, but no matter what, is it fair to say you will get to a point where you will fall out of love with doing your podcast and how do you know how to keep moving forward? Pieces of it, just like the planning business. Like there's pieces of the planning business I absolutely hate and that's okay. So guess what? When I hired the first person said, here's all the stuff you're going to do. So in the podcasting thing, I hate editing audio. It's super tedious and I hate it. So I outsourced it immediately. Like that was like the first thing that I absolutely did. Um, all the extra stuff, like I can do it and anything, all of it I can do. There's just pieces I don't like doing and that's okay. So that's what I outsourced. Well, I'm definitely getting the name of your audio editor because that's first on my list of shit to get rid of. Um, it's amazing. All right, let's try and uh, let's try and piece this together. We've got a few questions. We've definitely got a, a big bunch of questions coming through, so we're going to hammer through those. Uh, let's go gender equity. Let's go Trish first. Um, so as far as guests, do you think it's better to have someone who has something to plug or also in your instance like an actual doctor, et cetera, talking on a specific topic that resonates with them? I think I've had like five doctors on the show. Like it doesn't matter if they're a doctor or not. It matters if the content is going to be relevant for them. So Steve literally has been on the show. He's no connection to a doctor at all, but Steve had amazing content when we discussed budgeting and setting up with the buckets and all that great stuff. That course that you have, mm -hmm. I forget the name of it. Um, but I, I, I took the course, loved it and was like, please come on the show because this is going to be so valuable for everyone listening. And I was totally right. And I love it when I'm right. Cause it's not all the time. And people loved the show. I get comments all the time on, uh, on, on how great it was and how it's, it's fixing their budgeting problems. They can understand things better. Like the way that you broke it down was great. You'd, you had nothing really to promote. You came on the show just to help me out and to help them out. It wasn't like there were a bunch of advisors. I do have a few advisors listen to the show um, for like all the wrong reasons of figuring out how to like work with their clients, but you know, whatever. Um, but that was someone that didn't have a product to push that was coming on to just give some really good knowledge, but it was relevant to doctors. So if you have a guest, um, you know, obviously you want to tell them, you know, if you have something to push, if Steve had a book or something, they can do it. I just say at the end, like Steve, you're going to have a few minutes at the end to say whatever you want about whatever you want to push. Tell me where you want to go all the, to your website. Great. And then at the end, I'll be like, Steve, where can people find out about you and hear more about and read more of your awesome stuff. And then I'll let him go on for two minutes. And we both know that because I have so much content on the back end, everyone's going to hear it. So Steve isn't going to promote himself throughout the show. Mm. Just say, Hey, just promote yourself at the end. Everyone's going to hear it anyway. And it's way more impactful and it gives you a better show. Uh, awesome answer, bud. Uh, not least of which, because you just pumped up my own tires again. Nothing a lot better than that. Uh, so claim was a little bit late to the show, but, uh, and his question wasn't answered. Um, guests versus solo shows have you do you what's your view on that do you do do you ever mix it up and do some completely solo shows or are you like 100 percent guest only i like the guest format for what i'm doing um only because it, well i should say when i first launched i didn't want to just be me and i was more i had the fear of just launching the show much less how is someone going to sit and listen to me for 30 minutes like that sounds really boring and i like shows personally that have two people talking or more panel shows or whatever. So um, I didn't want to bring in someone full time. So I thought let's do a guest kind of rotation around. Um, I have done different things where I have people uh, record questions using a, a software called SpeakPipe. Literally it's free if they leave less than a one minute question. 
and you know Steve could pop in and say, "Hey, I've got a question on budgeting. We're we're running a little tight. Do you know of any ways that I can increase my knowledge on this?" And I'll be like, "Blah blah 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 blah." Like I'll literally play the clip because uh, we can edit it in and answer it. The the second show that I hinted at, um, we literally have people fill out this giant form. If you guys want to check it out and steal it if you want, I don't care. Financialresidency.com slash form. Uh, don't go fill it all the way out. I don't need to know everything, but just see what we're doing. And then at the end, I have two questions. One is um, like, please go to this site and it's financialresidency.com slash record or question or something and read through every answer that you have. And now I'm getting them to speak through their entire financial outlook or assessment that I'm doing on air. And then the last one is, would you be interested in hearing how I work with physicians all across the country? Um, yes or no. And I think like 80% of the people or more have done that have said yes. So um, I'm starting to build even lead funnel inside there, which is pretty cool, but I'm giving them a ton of value. I'm basically letting them for eight, seven, eight, nine minutes, say what their, you know, their income and their expenses are and what their student debt is and all these problems. And I'm giving them real feedback which is hugely valuable to them and everyone listening. Um, but I'm also working on the conversion piece. Another ripping uh, answer. I've got, we're going to uh, smush two questions into one. So Chris has got another one um, and so does Brett's. So Brett's questions around how much budget are you allocating for your team? And Chris mm -hmm. one sort of ties into, you know, are you outsourcing using things like Fiverr or something like that to try and keep the cost down? So graphics wise, I tried to, to use Fiverr. We've tried Upwork. Um, we've done some stuff ourselves. Um, it's really hit or miss. I don't have anyone that I love and have been super tied to. Um, but the graphics piece, that's really easy. You can submit Fiverr and, and that kind of thing. And I just had someone build me a template and then we just kind of mix and match. So if you go look at the shows and we're, we're going to be doing a rebrand pretty soon here. Um, and um, I'm trying to find more graphics help, but that has been easy. Um, as I outsource pieces um, and it's become more and more, when I first did it, it was just the audio editing because I just absolutely freaking hate it. And it was like $75 a show or something, um, which was absolutely worth it to me. And that person who does, uh, her name's Desiree, that uh, does it for me. And she's got a little team that kind of works with her, but I've outsourced social media presence to her. So I, she bulk stuff together. I approve it all. And then she makes sure it's dripped out appropriately. She's they're doing her team's doing the, the transcription to blog post writing. Um, she's doing obviously the auto editing. She's doing some of my graphic stuff, but not a lot. Um, she kind of wears a lot of hats. Um, so I, I pay her and then I've got some writers um, that I kind of am working on from a blog standpoint. Um, but essentially I, I pay like, I think now with the team somewhere in the $1,500 to $1,700 range. Um, and they do a ton of stuff for me and it is life altering. Amazing because I literally have multiple podcasts now. So $1,500 um, to $1,700, what's the cycles at per month? Per, per month. Okay. Per month. So I reinvest back in the show quite a bit because yeah, it gives you so much 20 clients. So, um, you know, instead of not giving anything back in, even though it's good growth, I want it to be double that by the end of the year, if I can. Uh, so more fantastic answers to questions again, helping me get going. I'm going to throw to Peter. I'm going to do an audio one. Um, Peter, I'm turning your access on. Uh, Hello, Ryan, Peter. Hello, Hi, Ryan. Thank you. That was really awesome. Firstly, awesome slides. Love oh, a lot of the slides. They're really gorgeous. I'm a bit of a slide freak, so a big tick on those. Uh, two questions. One, are you heading to podcast movement this year? I'm not. Uh, <gasps> I have a, a personal conflict and I'm not able to go this year. Oh. I went the last, years and those, the last couple of years and it's been really good. Cool. Okay, so it's well worth going to. Awesome. My second question was around that gap you talked about. So you said there's a whole lot of people listening. I think you said maybe residents, so, so younger so the clients that are perfect, but just a bit um, green. Um, mm -hmm. did, have you put thought about using a course? I mean, I know you talked about a membership site, but is there some one-to-many course you could give them that would fill that gap? Is that something you'd expect you'll have over time? 
Uh, maybe. So the course, I, I like the course, but they're static. And I feel like there's not a lot of one-on-one -on -one time that you're going to get there. You're going to get me on a video talking and that's great, but there's not a lot of ways to get feedback with questions and stuff. And um, I just know from working with like a hundred physician families, like doctors like to ask a lot of questions back and that's totally fine. So my thought with the membership site, um, cause I own financial residency.com, but I also own financial fellowship.com. So I'm thinking of treating it as like all the free stuff is financial residency. Some of the paid stuff is financial fellowship. And the idea would be, uh, once or twice a month, I'm coming in and at, people just ask me questions. I'm just answering them and giving them feedback and giving them a forum to, to kind of talk in. And I'm already creating video content uh, for clients. Um, you know, this is what estate planning is and this is what it looks like. Um, so I'm thinking about repurposing those, making the slides really fun and trying to make this kind of entertaining for them um, as well and being able to kind of drip content out that only they're going to get by being members of uh, the the membership site. Cool. I think the other lesson that stood out for me throughout this that I think both Steve and I suffer from is doing too much yourself. Mm. So I think just because we can learn how to edit doesn't mean we should. Yeah. Um, and I think that's probably, I have already six interviews recorded and haven't yet launched my podcast. And part of the issue is all of the other stuff that I was trying to learn how to do when I should just outsource it and get them launched. Yep. Yep. So I record lots and lots of shows now and I don't record a single or edit a single thing. <laughs> <'Cause> I, would <laughs> be, I would absolutely be the bottleneck. I hated it. It was the one, the thing I hated the absolute most out of podcast. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much. Of course. Thanks Peter. And thanks for reminding me that I, that I uh, try to do too much. Uh, I don't mind the idea though of, of learning how to do something and then learning that you hate that part and then handballing that to uh, somebody else or. Uh, yeah. You know, well, you have to do it to, to know what you're doing. Otherwise you're going to probably get taken advantage of. Yeah. Uh, so guys, so much, uh, so much exciting stuff came out of here. We, we've said to Ryan, um, we've said that Ryan's actually coming down under to uh, LTMA 20 and the dates are going to be announced for that very soon. Um, we should have an announcement in the next week. I've also twisted his arm and said, if we get enough interest from you lot, um, that he would actually consider building a how to become a podcast expert course. So he's going to join the uh, Advice Movement Coaches crew, um, which is fantastic. Uh, so we'll make sure we put details in around when his course is. Hopefully we're going to aim to try and have it live at around about the same time, so February next year, but there'll be a bit of a build up between now and then. Um, he'll be in the Facey group answering questions. If you're watching this on replay, uh, make sure you fill out the type form questionnaire that's going to come through so that you guys can get your points, which is the new another new exciting thing that we'll be announcing. Um, and other than that, mate, thanks so much for hanging out with us. I know it's quarter past eight and the craps table is just waiting for you to, to throw it's some dice me. at it. Like, come on, where are you? Uh, so thank you on behalf of everybody that is on the call now and watching it on replay, mate. It's been a, it's an, it's been an absolute cracker. Uh, thanks again. And I know it's not the last that we're hearing from you, but, uh, definitely first time off. It's been a, a fantastic effort. So thank you so much. Yeah. I appreciate you guys being on and stick through the, the full hour plus and great questions. And yeah, as Steve said, um, you know, I'm happy to, to answer questions and I think we'll be creating a, a course and, you know, Tell me what you want in it. Happy to awesome. create it. Fantastic, everybody. Have a, fair, have a great weekend for those that are there live. Ryan, gambles, gamble responsibly. And uh, we'll talk to you nice. all at the next, next AM webinar. See you guys. Bye, Take care.